Welcome to today's video about projectile motion. This will go along with um, worksheet 5.2. If we take a look here, we will notice that there are three different types of projectiles shown here. There's actually one more, but we're going to start with um, just talking about these and explaining what a projectile actually is so that we can understand them more clearly. This first one is what we were looking at in the last in the last uh, assignment, which was free fall. So the ball was just dropped and it just fell with no other forces um, acting on it other than gravity. So in this case, we know that if we were to draw a force diagram, say on the ball when it's at that point, the only thing that we would have would be a force straight down, which would be the force of gravity. So we have to keep in mind that the force of gravity causes an ex the acceleration of gravity, and so the force of gravity is 10 newtons, and it causes an acceleration equal to the acceleration of gravity, which is 10 meters per second squared, because it causes an object that has a mass of one kilogram to accelerate at a rate um, to need a, sorry, the force of 10 newtons will cause a, an object of one kilogram to accelerate at a rate of one of 10 meters per second squared. All right, in the second um, picture here, we still have the same ball, the same kid, but now instead of dropping it off a rock, he's standing on a ground and he's throwing it straight up and it's coming straight down again. This is also a projectile because again, we could pick any one of these dots and we could say that the only force acting on it is the force of gravity, whether it's going up or down. So it's going up in this direction, it's coming down over here, but there's no other forces acting on it other than the force of gravity. The force that the student applies right as they throw it upwards is not a continual force, so it gives it its initial speed, but that's it. So the initial force gives the ball speed, its initial speed, and that's it. Okay, it, does, it no longer influences it as soon as they let go of it. Um, the third one here is also the same ball, same kid, thrown up, but now it's thrown at a bit of an angle. So it's going to go up and then down, so the path is more visible that it is actually parabolic. And all the projectiles that we're going to look at will have a parabolic um, path. Also notice that when we look at the pictures of the ball and its path here, that it really actually looks a lot like a motion map. So with the motion map, we could, on this last one, we could say, oh, all right, well, it's going to have a large speed here, and then its speed's going to be smaller and smaller and smaller, and then it's not going to have a speed at the top because it's going to be turning around, and then it, its speed's going to increase again, but in the opposite direction, and again, and again, and again. So again, remember these arrows are representing the speeds. Obviously the last arrow that goes into the ground is just so that you can see that it's going quite fast. The ground would definitely stop this. These types of projectiles all follow the same kinematics rules that we've had before. They also all have a little bit of a variety to them and they deal with vectors as well. So we're going to put all that stuff together that we've been talking about so far into the projectile. Now there is one more um, type of projectile that is not shown here and this is the one that we're going to start with. So let's see what's on the next page. So focus on the left-hand side for the moment. Let's ignore the right-hand side. If we have a cannon at the top of a cliff and it is shot out horizontally, then if we pretend that gravity is not existent, is non-existent, okay, that's what this means here, gravity-free path. 
if there's no gravity, then this ball will just shoot straight out. And it will shoot with whatever the initial velocity is. Notice that the distance between the balls is the same the entire time. Because there's no gravity, there's nothing changing the speed in the x direction. So I'm going to say that this is a v-naught in the x direction to keep that clear in our heads. So there's no acceleration. So v naught x, we could really say, is just the velocity in the x direction. It does not change. There's no forces acting on, no unbalanced forces acting on it in this situation. All right. So if we wanted to find out how far this was going to go, well, if there's no gravity, it would um, go forever. But remember that with no acceleration, then we can just say that velocity in the x direction is however far it goes in the x over the time it takes to get there. So we can go all the way back to one of the first equations that we learned to explain this situation. If we turn on gravity again, you will notice that the Cannonball, again, has a parabolic trajectory. Trajectory is a fancy name for path of travel. So it once again has a parabolic trajectory. Notice that the dots still line up vertically, which means that even in this case, the velocity in the x direction is a constant. Okay, the velocity in the x direction does not change because it is not affected by gravity. Keep in mind that the force of gravity is a downward force, so it does not affect horizontal motion. It only affects what goes on in the vertical. So when we look at this path, what we now have to understand is that the y and x velocities are different. So in this case, the y velocity is not constant. And, in fact, there is acceleration in the y. And that acceleration is equal to the acceleration of gravity. So in this case, even though it is free fall still with the force of gravity being the only thing that's acting on it, we have to break it down into two parts. When we're talking about the horizontal, we can use the original equation here, and we can say that velocity in x direction is your distance traveled in the x direction over time. If we put gravity in, this here is the distance in the x direction. It is also called the range. The y direction, however, we have to make some changes to. For the y direction, we have to remember that there is acceleration, so we have to use the kinematics equations. The other thing we want to remember is we're only talking about motion in the y direction, so we can change our subscripts in our kinematics equations to make them more clear. And I don't have much space here on the right-hand side, so I may have to move over to the left as well. In fact, I'm just going to go like this so that we know that all of this is about the acceleration in the y. So now we can we have to go back and we need to use the idea of the equation that v final is equal to v initial plus at. But now we're going to say v final in the y, v initial in the y, and our acceleration is due to gravity. So I can change that to a g. Similarly, we can go on to v final squared in the y is equal to v initial squared in the y plus 2ax. But a again is gravity, and it's not an x distance any longer that it's traveling, but it's this y distance. So 2ay is what it becomes. And the last one that we use a lot here, then, is the x equals v naught t plus 1 half at squared. Again, I'm going to change it to remind us that we're working on the y only. And rather than it being x, it's going to be 
y is equal to v naught y t plus one half a is gravity, so g t squared. So these are the three main equations that you're going to have to use in the y, and the x, you're going to have to remember that they are the simple equation of no acceleration, so v is equal to distance over time. With this information, I want to do um, a bit of a simulation here to show you how the x range changes depending, depending on the y. All right, so we are at a physics classroom interactive here. I have it set up so that we have a cliff here at um, a height of 90 meters. We have it starting with the x displacement of 0, y displacement 90 meters. We have a speed of 40 meters per second, and it's going to be released at the zero, at zero angles, 0 degrees. So it's going to be shot straight out. We're going to show the path. We have the velocity vector, which is in red here. We have the acceleration vector in blue. Watch both of them carefully, OK? And let's see what happens. You can see that as it goes, we have a quite a change in what's happening. The acceleration vector has not changed the entire time because it's still just acceleration due to gravity. The velocity vectors, however, notice that we now have two of them. We have a horizontal and a vertical one. Let's play that one more time. And watch, I'm going to get rid of the acceleration vector. And watch carefully the velocity vector in the y direction. Notice it's small, and then it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And eventually you'll see that the y displacement is now 0 because it started at 90. And the x displacement is 171.43 meters. So it's gone quite a distance now. If we are um, talking about this path and we want to find out the displacement, let's look and see what happens. Oh wait, at the top it even shows that it took 4.286 seconds. So from 4.286 seconds and the displacement, if I didn't give you what the initial speed was, you could figure that one out. Let's try this again. Let's change the height to being 70 and see what happens to everything. Again, the same sort of path occurs. The speed in the y direction increases, but notice that the range decreases drastically. So does the time it takes to get there. And now let's do one more thing here. Let's go back up to 90. Uh, 88 might be close enough. Oh, there's 90. And let's change the speed. Okay, let's have the speed be 27 instead of the 40. It still follows a parabolic path. However, its path is significantly less than what it was before. Still takes the same amount of time to fall because it still has the same y distance that it needs to fall of 90 meters. But the x displacement is significantly less because it's not being shot out at enough speed, at a fast enough speed. Let's make it higher than the 40. I'm sure by now you can guess what's going to happen when that occurs. Let's make it 53. Same height, same angle of start. Now notice that the displacement is significantly greater. It's 227.15 meters. The time, however, again, is still the same because the object is still trying to go through the same amount of vertical space. So when we think about projectile motion, we have to keep in mind all of these different factors. Are we talking about the x direction or the y direction? Are we talking about something that's being shot off horizontally or vertically or at an angle? At the moment, we're going to stick to just horizontal shoot offs. We have to figure out if we're talking about finding out the y, the height of the hill or whatever it is you're throwing it from, or the x, the range at which it flies. So, oh, that's the. Um, the URL for the simulation we were just looking at, if you want to come back to this recording and check it out yourselves, there it is. All right, let's look at this problem. A pool ball leaves a 0.6 meter high table with an initial horizontal velocity of 2.4 meters per second. 
predict the time required for the pool ball to fall to the ground and the horizontal distance between the table's edge and the ball's landing location. When you're solving projectile motion problems, the most important thing to do is to draw a picture right away. Okay, so here's my table. Here's the ground. I know that this here is 0.6 meters. I also know that the initial horizontal velocity is 2.4 meters per second. So y is equal to 0.6. Vx is equal to 2.4 meters per second. It is a projectile. Once it is launched, it will come down like this. And it will um, therefore have a velocity in the y. It will also have a, um, an acceleration because it's projectile and it's in free fall. That will be gravity. We don't need to figure out the velocity in the y direction for this, but I'm just putting it there that it will have one. All right. And then we know that it will fall in some amount of time. And that's what we're looking for. And the other thing that we're looking for is how far away will it fall? Where will it land? So we're looking for this x here as well. So now that we have written down everything we know and what we need to know, we can go ahead and get started. Let's just put in that acceleration is 10 meters per second squared. Okay, so we're sure that all the units match up there. So um, if I want to find out how long this is going to take, then I need to start with the equation that has the information in it I need, I know. So y is equal to v naught y t plus one half g t squared. Now the initial velocity in the y direction is zero because it was launched horizontally, so this goes to zero. The Then I have that y is equal to one-half g t squared. I am looking for t, so I can solve this for t and find out that t is equal to the square root of 2y over g. You're going to use this format of this equation a lot in this section, so you might want to jot this format down as well as indicating that it comes from this first equation. So when I plug in my numbers here, I get that time is the square root of 2 times 0.6 divided by gravity, which is 10. When I solve that, I find out the time it takes to fall is 0 0.35 seconds. The second part of our question was, what is the horizontal distance between the table's edge and the ball's landing location? So that's our x. Remember that in the x direction, the velocity is constant. So x is equal to vt, v being the velocity in the x that we started with. So we now know that, well, we've known from the beginning that the initial velocity was 2.4. We now know that the speed is 0.35. I would su strongly suggest that you not put in your rounded number here, but instead put in what that actually equals to, what the square root of 2 times 0.6 over 10 actually equals 2. Put that in here for your t value. Um, I'm only going to write part of it down, but put it into your calculator. Put the whole thing into your calculator. When you do that, you find out that it will travel 0 0.83 meters. The range will be 0 0.83 meters. So in this equation, in this problem rather, we've got all of the basic parts. We have looking for time, looking for displacement on the x direction given the initial velocity. Let's do one more. Here we have a soccer ball that's kicked horizontally from a 22 meter high hill and it lands a distance of 35 meters from the edge of the hill you want to determine the initial horizontal velocity of the soccer ball. So now in this case, we know some different things than we did before, but we're still going to start the same way. We're still going to start with our hill, and we know that our hill is 22 meters. 
The reason why it says 22.0 meters is because that gives us another um, significant digit, another, when we do this math out, another value that we can keep in our answer. We also know that when the soccer ball was kicked, it landed over here a distance of 35 meters away. We are trying to find what is the initial velocity of the soccer ball. Well, we know again that the acceleration is equal to gravity, which is 10 meters per second squared. We know y is 22.0 meters. We know that x is 35.0 meters and we're trying to find Vx. In order to find Vx, we know that we need to have the um, time. So, we, even though we're not asked for it, we actually need the time first, because remember that x is equal to V naught t, V naught xt, so we need that time. So the velocity in the x direction is the displacement over the time. So let's start with the time. I'm going to use that equation that we had on the last problem that we worked through when we eventually solved for the time in the y direction, which would be 2 square root of 2y over g. Remember, it's the same amount of time, whether you're talking about it as the time in the y direction or the time in the x direction. It's just that if you know the y height, then it's easy to find the time it takes because it's just, it's just like we did in free fall. So if we plug our numbers in here, we get the square root of 2 times 22 divided by 10, which works out to be about 2.1 seconds when we round it. Now that we know that, we can go back up to this equation and say, okay, so the velocity in the x direction is the x displacement of 35.0 meters over the time. Now the time really was not 2.1, it was 2.0976. So that's what I tend to put in to get a more accurate value. And this turns out to give us an initial velocity of this soccer ball of 16.69 meters per second. So, between the last problem and this problem, you've seen all of the different things that the, that the problems can ask you for at this point in time. Always start with drawing a picture, and then after you've drawn your picture, make sure you write down what variables you know, what you don't know. Don't forget that acceleration in these cases is the acceleration of gravity, which is 10 meters per second squared. That is it for the moment. So. Bye for now.